So you've implemented the map and you've determined that there's room for you to compete on Amazon. That's great. Now it's time to identify what is required to create an offer that will convert on Amazon and have browsers turning into buyers every single day of the week without fail. I do this by determining what I call the gap. I can tell you right now without question that this is something you're going to love and something you're going to do every time you launch a new product on Amazon. When you do this, your chances of creating a surefire winning product on Amazon multiply considerably. So what is the gap and why is it so important? In simple terms, we want to take a look at our competition and ask ourselves what's missing from their offer. When we find items that are in demand and qualify them through the Google Sheet, we've effectively found a product that has a very high probability of becoming a winning item. What makes it a surefire winning item is adding in bonuses and improving product features in the market to create what we call differentiation. In other words, we're finding ways to stand out in the marketplace and make our offer the only logical offer for the consumer to buy. You see, selling anything or selling exactly what everyone else is selling gives customers no reason to buy from you whatsoever. You simply become one of the many who will pick up the odd sale here and there. We don't want that and I want you to dominate. So let's take a look at how to find the gap. When we're identifying gaps or holes in our competitors' offers, we look at six key areas to come up with winning ideas for our offer. They are identifying what bonus items our competitors are giving away with their core product, what product features are missing from our competitors' offers, are our competitors' items selling but are poorly built and therefore producing a poor product performance, where can we add value to the offer, this is different to product bonuses, we'll exp I'll explain the difference in a moment, are competitors' pricing strategies off, and finally, what cosmetically speaking are our competitors offering and could we for instance offer a different more appealing colour or style to everyone else that would help us stand out in the market. Now don't worry, I'm not going to leave you wondering how to do all this, in fact I'll break down each of these down for you right now. Let's start with bonus items. Okay, so you may already be aware, bonus items are complementary items that boost a product offering. In other words, they are physical items that are offered in addition to the core product and are in some way related to the item. Let's imagine we're selling a barbecue grill covering. Well, an example of a product bonus that you could pack with the cover you're selling could be a cooking timer. You see, we know that the person who's buying the item has a barbecue and they use it to cook. So we add in a physical item for free that the person may use. We're deeper into bonuses when we're creating our own shortly. But for now, just know that they are physical items that are packed with the core product that we're selling. They must come together. This is very important. These bonuses increase the novelty factor of our listings and shouldn't alter the product price, meaning we shouldn't try to add a bonus in with the sole purpose of increasing the sale price. Again, the bonus must be relevant to the core product. For instance, we wouldn't give a luggage scale away with a barbecue grill cover. So take a look at the competing items and take notes on the product bonuses that they're giving away. In fact, you may have already seen this earlier when we were identifying isolated and non-isolated products in the shortlist phase. If your competitors aren't offering a bonus item, then you've just identified a gap in the market. This is what we want to see for now. There are a couple of other key points to take down about bonuses before we move on. Number one, adding in bonuses makes it difficult for our competitors to react. This is especially true if our competition has a well-established offer. Offers that have been selling on Amazon for a long period of time can become impossible to change as Amazon don't want to alter something that's working. This is good news for us. Secondly, bonuses can help you stimulate product reviews organically when you begin selling. If your bonus is particularly strong, this can result in people thinking to themselves, that offer was so good, I'm going to post a review. This is great because it gets us real organic reviews that we never have to push or beg for. Thirdly, it may help you to command a premium price. As I said, I don't add in bonuses with the intention of increasing our item's price. But we may find through testing that we can command a premium price because we offer a product bonus. This is a very good thing. And finally, it helps create some longevity with our listing. You'll find that many sellers won't go to the effort of adding in a good physical bonus. Why? Because it does take some effort. But when you're outperforming everyone in your market, that effort becomes worth it. Why? Because it'll make you money for years. Now let's talk about missing product features. When we're looking at our competition, it's always possible to assume that they have found the most optimal, perfect product possible. This can limit us, as we may go in search of a product that simply matches the item we've found or the items that are available in that market, without asking ourselves whether or not there are other products available that have additional features that a customer would look at and would actually prefer over what is currently available. So when you look at a product, ask yourself if there are any other features that are missing. That feature must be relevant 
and we must be able to find a supplier who can actually supply us with that product. Remember, we want to buy a pre-existing product that we're going to brand. We don't want to create new products from scratch, and certainly not to begin with anyway. We'll show you how to find those suppliers shortly, of course. But for now, just take notes on some of your ideas. A great way to determine whether or not a product feature is something that a customer actually wants is to look at the customer reviews relating to your competitors' items on Amazon. They will reveal a treasure trove of what to do and what not to do. You may be wondering how to do this review mining process. Well, let's take a look. As you can see on our review mining sheet, we have three distinct columns. Column one is where we'll log what customers love about our competitors' items. We wanna make certain that the items we're sourcing at least have these features in place. For instance, we may find in the case of a pool rake that customers said they'd love the fact that the item had an extendable handle. We'd note this down and make certain that our item had an extendable handle when we begin sourcing the product. We might even look at this and ask ourselves whether we can add to the handle by adding, for example, a cushioned ergonomic covering to make it more comfortable to hold. I'm sure you're beginning to see how this works right now. Okay, so we go through two to three of our competitors' listings and start noting down all of these love statements. We'll then log anything the customer hated about our competitors' items in column number two. These are, of course, features that we absolutely want to avoid at all costs. I don't think I even need to say why this is. In the case of our pool rake, we may have found that customers didn't like the fact that the mesh basket tore easily or it couldn't hold particular fine sand particles. We want to make sure that our item doesn't have these issues. We'd pay particular attention to the mesh basket when sampling this type of item and we'd test it vigorously so that we're safe in the knowledge that our item will perform impeccably for the end consumer. Finally, we want to log any customer wants or preferences that we may uncover when looking at these competitor listings. We'd pay particular attention to statements such as, I really like the extendable handle, but I wish they had a, an extra screw into the handle extender as mine formed a crack in it after using it five or six times. You'll look at this type of feedback as ways to improve your own offer. Log all of this and make certain that you see it as part of your sourcing process. So in summary, here's how to review mine. Step one, locate customer reviews for two to three competitor listings. Next, go through five and four star reviews to find what they love. You may also find wants here, of course, so be open and vigilant when going through each step and log what's important. Three star reviews will likely tell you what they want to see and therefore two and one star reviews will tell you what they hate and what you should avoid at all costs with your own item. Now log all these ideas in the review mining sheet as you go along. Simple as that but extremely powerful. Let me show you how to do this over the shoulder so you know what to look for when doing your own research. So when we do review mining, we look at a number of very similar product listings to the one that we are considering in our research. We simply go into a product listing and click on the number of reviews beneath the product title, and this takes us to the bottom of the listing. Here are all of the reviews for us to mine. If we want to go into the five star ratings, then we simply Click the link next to the five stars, and this will show you all of the five star reviews. We can then go into the four star reviews by clicking on the four stars in the drop down here. We can go into the three star reviews here and keep working our way down to the one, two star, and the one star reviews. The idea is that you go through the reviews and read them and put any relevant notes into the review mining sheet. You will record the things that people loved about the product the things that people hate about the product, and also the things that people would like to see in the product. Let's move on to gap number three, product performance. So as you were doing the review mining exercise, you may have uncovered products that are selling well but are performing badly. Generally speaking, the reason a product doesn't perform is because the seller didn't take much time to test the product before they ordered it. It's very easy to become impatient as you go through the product research process, but it's this type of short-term thinking that will hurt your business. The best advice I have for you is to purchase these products from your competitor. The reason for this is that it allows us to review what the problem is with the item and why it's happening. This will be vital when you're sampling the items you source with your suppliers. You'll be able to compare your item to this item and you can determine whether or not you have found an item that is superior in quality and performance. I've seen so many items do well but then fall off the face of the earth and in some cases completely disappear due to poor product performance. You'll want to, of course, make a note of these deficiencies at all times. Skip these steps at your peril. Remember, I'm giving you everything I can to help you avoid the mistakes I've made in the past. Whenever I've followed everything I'm sharing with you to a T, 
I've had absolutely no issues whatsoever and my products have performed as expected. When I skipped these steps, I was sorry. Now let's talk about gap number four or value add. And I said that value add was different to adding in product bonuses. You may still be wondering what this means. The key with value add is looking at items that can be sold as a pack and seeing if we can include more than one item as part of the core product instead of selling it as a single unit. An example would be a pack of four light bulbs. You could sell a single light bulb, however it may make, and in this case would make, a lot more sense to sell more than one item at a time as the end consumer will use more than one of these items. Another good example would be barbecue skewers. You could sell a single skewer, however the end consumer will use more than one and would always buy multiple units at a time as opposed to a single unit unless for some strange reason they just wanted one skewer. Sometimes we may look at a single item and determine that this type of item would actually work better as a multi-pack. A good example is our light bulb again. We may see that everyone is selling single light bulbs. We can then ask ourselves whether or not it makes sense to create a pack and add value to increase the impact of the offer. The key here is to make certain that it actually makes sense. You see, if your only strategy is to create bigger pack sizes, then you can end up in a situation where you're selling 50 light bulbs. Would people buy 50? Well, a certain type of customer would, but it certainly wouldn't be the norm. It's difficult to give you an exact breakpoint on pack sizes, as it does depend on the product. Generally speaking, it'll be obvious to you when a pack size is getting out of hand. You see items that are already sold as packs. We always want to ask ourselves if we can optimize the value. Can we include more units that no one else is? Can we also decrease the number of units if we find that customers would buy less for a smaller fee? This isn't adding value, but it's certainly optimizing the value. This is pretty rare, however. Finally, we can create what we call a combo cocktail. When we create a pack that includes the product bonus as well, to increase the value even more and build an even more powerful offer. It's important to note that your pack and your bonus must all be delivered as one sellable unit. They can't be separated. When you're looking at your competition, begin to ask yourself these questions and look for ways to give more at the same price that your competition gives less. If everyone in your market offers a six pack, see if you can disrupt the market by offering an eight pack with a bonus at the same price. This is powerful strategy and for many years was the only thing I did to differentiate my offers on Amazon. Now let's dive into pricing in more detail. Researching, we must become very, very aware of our competitors' offers. Many other gurus out there claim that price isn't important on online marketplaces. And I can tell you that after doing this for more than 20 years, price is extremely important. Why? Because we're selling simple items where the brand isn't the driving force behind the sale. Customers are looking for what we're selling for sure, but we must offer it to them at a price that gets them to take out their credit card and buy. By becoming aware of our competitors' pricing, we can get a good gauge as to where our price needs to be. Remember, we'll still be using the strategies I've outlined in this module, such as adding bonuses, improving or increasing the product features, and many more. But many times we'll gauge this by matching the market leader's price. We'll use this price as a basis for our profit calculations shortly. Now you may find that over time as your product gains more traction, you can actually increase your price. But to begin with, we're going to match the leader. You don't want to become a lower priced option. We must be competitive and we must be realistic as to what price we will actually receive for our product. Many times I see sellers who say, well, I'm giving a bonus and a bigger pack size, so I'm going to sell for $24.99 instead of $19.99. This type of thinking will hurt you when you're starting out. Instead, establish how you can offer your item for $19.99 and blow your competitors away with your offering. Please establish a real retail price. Sell your item for say $19.99 instead of $20.47. These prices are odd and are the sign of a less sophisticated seller. You're still better off as you're selling your item at a price people will understand. If competitors are selling for these strange prices then that can become a gap for you. The key we're looking to establish here is what the customer is getting for the price they're paying and whether we can disrupt the market with something better at the same or slightly reduced price. Okay, we're at the final gap talking about cosmetic color and style. First of all, I want to consider what I call the product genesis. Let's return to our barbecue grill cover example. We can see on Amazon that barbecue grill covers sell and people buy them. There's demand for that type of product, right? Well, we want to ask ourselves if there is a style or color that will help us stand out. Can we find a barbecue grill cover that looks different to what everyone else or the majority of the market is selling 
and will that alone be enough to make sales? We see that everyone offers only grey barbecue grill covers. Could we sell a green one? Would that help us stand out? Now we obviously want to make sure that the style or colour makes sense. We don't want to sell a hot pink barbecue grill cover if we're selling primarily to men, right? We also don't want to change the colour or style just for the sake of doing it. Again, in this case, if we saw that no one else sold a hot pink barbecue grill cover, then we'd simply say, yes, I've found a way to stand out in this market. Well, yes, you will stand out, but will you make sales? The thing to do for now is to note possible ideas. We'll then look for suppliers who sell that type or style of them a little later on. Also note down products that don't seem to have a different style out there and see if you can find something that looks a little different to the rest of the market. You can see this one is quite subjective, so take your time and always ask yourself if your target audience would actually buy it or not. The best strategy is to find something that's slightly different style to everyone else, but is essentially the same product. When you become more advanced, you can look to test different colors and become more advanced. To wrap up this module, note that not every product will have gaps all the time. We simply want to list them when we see an opportunity to do so. But don't become hung up only finding products that have gaps. Also note that there may only be one gap open to us. Maybe our competitors have done a bonus with their core item. We can't really do anything cosmetically with the item, so our best path is to look to add value. That's 100% fine. Simply note what you see and move on. Finally, note all of these ideas in your research notes in the Google Sheet that I showed you earlier. And don't let this scare you too much. Most people sell items that are complete copies of everyone else. If you can even add just one gap in, you'll do infinitely better than these types of sellers. And remember, with the strategy you're learning, you're not going to get into any insanely competitive niches until you're much more advanced. I've made sure that, by the way, I've designed the program and the BSR limits you're using earlier. So go out there and note down some gaps and create an amazing offer.